Chapter 8, Security Management Models. As William O. Douglas, Supreme Court Justice, noted, security can only be achieved by constant change through discarding old ideas that have outlived their usefulness and adapting others to current fact. In this chapter, we will get the opportunity to, do, to use models to adapt the situation to current fact. In this chapter, we will cover the following five learning outcomes. Describe the dominant InfoSec blueprints, frameworks, and InfoSec management models, including U.S. government sanctioned models. Explain why access control is an essential element of InfoSec management. Recommend an InfoSec management model and explain how it can be customized to meet the needs of a particular organization. Describe the fundamental elements of key InfoSec management practices. And finally, discuss emerging trends in the certification and accreditation of U.S. federal information technology systems. We will discuss these five learning outcomes in the following six sections. Section one, blueprints, frameworks, and security models. In this section, we will cover the first learning outcome. Describe the dominant InfoSec blueprints, frameworks, and InfoSec management models, including U.S. government sanctioned models. Let's start with what are InfoSec models. InfoSec models are standards that are used for reference or comparison, and they often serve as a stepping off point for emulation and adoption. One way to select a methodology is to adapt or adopt an existing security management model or set of practices. Because each InfoSec environment is unique, you may need to modify or adapt portions of several frameworks. What works well for one organization may not precisely fit another. We know that InfoSec professionals must design a working security plan and have talked about methods of achieving a good plan. Then what? Do we cross our fingers and hope it works? The next step is to implement a management model to execute and maintain that plan. This process may begin with the creation or validation of a security framework, followed by an InfoSec blueprint that describes existing controls and identifies other necessary security controls. A framework is the outline of the more thorough blueprint, which is the basis for the design, selection, and implementation of all subsequent security controls. Most organizations draw from established security models and practices to develop a blueprint or methodology. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. A security model is a generic blueprint offered by a service organization. Another way to create a blueprint is to look at the paths taken by other organizations. In this kind of benchmarking, you follow the recommended practices or well-established industry standards. Benchmarking is the comparison of two related measurements. You may compare them to your industry, to regulatory components, whatever is, is relevant for your organization. To summarize, information security professionals use security models to protect the organization's information assets. These models are then adapted or adopted to the organization's unique characteristics regulatory requirements and resources to adopt or adapt appropriate security plans. Many organizations use benchmarking to see how others in similar industries and situations may be implementing security models. 
We continue with Chapter 8, Security Management Models. This is Section 2, Access Control. In this section, we will cover the second learning outcome, explain why access control is an essential element of InfoSec management. We've talked about access control in previous chapters, but let's look more closely at modeling access control as an integral part of the InfoSec plan. Access controls regulate the admission of users into trusted areas of the organization, both the logical access to the information systems and the physical access to the organization's facilities. Access control is maintained by means of a collection of policies, programs to carry out those policies, and technologies that enforce the, policy, the policies. The general application of access control comprises four processes. First is identification, or obtaining the identity of the entity requesting access to a logical or physical area. Second is authentication, or confirming the identity of the entity seeking access to a logical or physical area. Third is authorization, or determining which actions an authorized in entity can perform in that physical or logical area once they have been authenticated. Finally, we have accountability, which is documenting the activities of the authorized individuals and systems. Each of these processes must be planned for, designed into the system, and monitored and updated over time to ensure the implementation of proper information security plans. Access control is built on several key principles, least privilege, need to know, and separation of duties. First is the concept of least privilege, which is the principle by which members of the organization can only access the minimum amount of information for the minimum amount of time necessary to perform their required duties. Second is need to know, which limits a user's access to the specific information required to perform the currently assigned task and not merely to the category of data required for a general work function. Finally, we have separation of duties, which is a control requiring that significant tasks be split up in such a way that more than one individual is responsible for their, that completion. In that way, one individual does not have too much power to intentionally or unintentionally have a mistake occur. There are several categories of access control, including deterrent. These types of controls discourage or deter an incident from ever happening. Preventative. These types of controls help an organization avoid an incident in the first place. Detective. These controls detect or identify an incident or threat when it occurs. Corrective. These controls remedy a circumstance or mitigate damage done during an incident. And finally, recovery. These controls restore operating conditions back to normal. Compensating controls resolve any of the shortcomings in the preceding controls. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. It does provide a way to identify entities by their needs as follows. Management, operational and administrative, and technical controls. Management controls cover security processes that are designed by strategic planners, integrated into the organization's management practices, and routinely used by security administrators to design, implement, and monitor other control systems. 
Operational or administrative controls deal with the operational functions of security that have been integrated into the repeatable processes of the organization. Finally, technical controls support the tactical portion of a security program and have been implemented as reactive mechanisms to deal with the immediate needs of the organization as it responds to the realities of the technical environment, which is naturally not secure. Putting the categories and controls together, we can take a look at each. At the management, entity, or level, deterrence could include published policies prohibiting activities, you can't do something, preventative measures like requiring registration before you can log in, detective controls that publish periodic violation reports where someone got into your system, corrective measures that terminate, terminate the employee's account upon termination from the organization, even if it's a planned and peaceful exit, and recovery measures such as a disaster recovery plan, followed by compensating controls that separate duties into multiple parts. I don't have access to the entire Coke um, trade secret recipe. It's divided among multiple people. At the operational level, deterrence may include warning signs, posters or electronic warning signs as deterrence gates, fences, and guards to prevent unauthorized access, sentries and video monitoring to detect problems as they occur. They could be watching you as you work to try to prevent problems. Fire suppression systems to automatically put out a fire as a corrective response. And disaster recovery plans to allow recovery and defense in depth to compensate for the security breaches when, not if, they occur. At the technical level, warning banners, service deterrence, login systems as preventative measures only authorized users can get in, audit logs to detect problems, forensics procedures to analyze what happened and take corrective measures, data backups to recover from a security incident, and key logging and system logs as compensating activities. At least you can see who did something that was a problem. Let's move to mandatory access controls. They are required to sufficiently implement the information security plan. They are structured and coordinated within a data classification scheme that rates each collection of information as well as each user. These ratings are often referred to as sensitivity levels or classification levels. When mandatory access controls are implemented, users and data owners have limited control over access to information resources. Instead, access is granted based on specific controls and categories of entities. In summary, access control models determine who has access to information security resources based on their needs. Access control models must be maintained over the long term, reviewed at scheduled and unscheduled times, and updated over time. Access control models do provide valuable tools for protection of information security resources. We continue with Chapter 8, Security Management Models. This is Section 3, Classified Information. In this section, we will cover components of the second and third learning outcomes, explain why access control is an essential element of InfoSec management, and recommend an InfoSec management model, and explain how it can be customized to meet the needs of a particular organization. 
Choosing a data classification model is an important part of InfoSec planning and imp implementation. Public, private, and military organizations use a variety of, variety of classification schemes. When selecting a scheme, you have to choose a model that secures the information assets from invalid access, both physical and digital. Before selecting a model, data owners must classify all of the information assets for which they are responsible. Further, they must review these classifications periodically to ensure the proper classification data and the appropriate use of access controls. For example, data might be classified as public for official use only, sensitive, and or classified. As you might expect, the U.S. military classification scheme relies on a more complex categorization system than the schemes of most corporation. For most information, the U.S. military uses a five-level classification scheme as defined in Executive Order 12958. Data is described as unclassified, sensitive but unclassified, confidential, secret, or top secret. Each of these classifications of data have different meanings and are handled in different ways. In a security clearance structure, each user of an information asset is assigned an authorization level that indicates the highest level of information classification they may access based on their needs. Most organizations have developed roles and corresponding security clearances, so individuals are already assigned into groups that correlate with the classifications of the information assets they need for their work. In the need to know principle, regardless of one's security clearance, an individual is not allowed to view data simply because it falls within that individual's level of clearance. They have to have a need for the data as well. Managing an information asset includes all aspects of its life cycle, from specification to design, acquisition, implementation, use, storage, distribution, backup, recovery, retirement, and destruction. An information asset that has a classification designation other than unclassified or public must be clearly marked as such with a cover page and headers and footers. You want to avoid unintended security breaches and clear labels will help most people choose to do the right thing particularly with email, which is so easy to forward now, you need to make sure these things are correctly marked. To maintain the confidentiality of classified documents, managers can implement a clean desk policy, requiring employees to secure all information in, a, in an appropriate storage container at the end of each business day. A storage container may be secure cloud computing, that requires login with user ID and password before allowed access. An additional security layer may require a file to be password protected on top of requiring a, a simple login and password. Or perhaps a code is sent to your company authorized cell phone as a second factor authorization to make sure that the information assets are protected. When copies of classified information are no longer value, or too many copies exist, care should be taken to destroy them properly to discourage dump, dumpster diving. While bins stored on private property may be protected from trespassers, in 1998, the Supreme Court ruled that there is no expectation of privacy for items thrown away in trash or refuse containers. Thus, the term you've probably heard, dumpster diving, which literally means going into a dumpster. However, dumpster diving goes beyond simply going through your physical trash, which should be carefully disposed, secured on its own. 
You want to wipe clean any information assets that are stored digitally when it's time to dispose of them. Here we see a couple of examples of military document cover pages. One is marked confidential, another secret, and another for official use only. Each of these data classification categories has different rules for how they should be treated and your employees should know and understand the rules that apply. A variation on the mandatory access control, lattice-based access controls assign users a matrix of authorizations for particular areas of access. The level of authorization may vary depending on the classification authorizations that individuals or entities possess for each group of information assets or resources. For instance, if you're a manager, you may have access to your direct reports, but not to the direct reports in other departments. The lattice structure contains subjects and objects, and the boundaries associated with each subject-object pair are clearly marked, setting up permissions and limitations for the entity or user. Non-discretionary controls are determined by a central authority in the organization and can be based on roles called Role-Based Access Controls, or RBAC, or on a specified set of tasks, in which case they're called task-based controls. Role-based controls are tied to the role that a particular user performs in an organization, whereas task-based controls are tied to the particular assignment or responsibility. Discretionary access controls are implemented, as the name implies, at the discretion or option of the data user. Users can allow general, unrestricted access, or they can allow specific individuals or sets of individuals to access these resources. Most personal computing operating systems are designed based on this model. One discretionary model is rule-based access control, where access is granted based on a set of rules specified by whoever, whichever group, is the central authority. Let's move on to other forms of access controls. One is content-dependent access controls. As the name suggests, access to a specific set of information may be dependent on its content, so accounting information for the accounting department. Another form is constrained user interfaces. Some systems are designed specifically to restrict what information an individual user can access. Think ATMs here. Finally, you may implement access controls that are temporal or time-based isolation. With this option, access to information is limited by a time of day constraint, for instance, like time release safes. While access control may be simplified for organizations, Military and U.S. government organizations may have complex access roles. Any organization with confidential data, and that's really all organizations, should carefully manage access to sensitive data. The InfoSec professionals who manage classified data must protect access and only allow authorized individuals or entities to view manage and or update the data. There are multiple methods of managing access, including non-discretionary, discretionary, and lattice-based models, and InfoSec professionals should use the model most appropriate for the organization or use components of the models and adapt to satisfy the security of the organizational data. We continue with Chapter 8, Security Management Models. This is Section 4, Security Architecture Models. 
In this section, we will cover the third learning outcome, recommend an InfoSec management model, and explain how it can be customized to meet the needs of a particular organization. Security architecture models illustrate information security implementations and may help organizations to quickly make improvements through adaptation. When we look at how models are used with technology and policies, we see that some models are implemented into computer hardware and software, some are implemented as policies and practice, and others are implemented in both. Similarly, when we look at the importance of confidentiality and data integrity, some models focus on the confidentiality of information, while others focus on the integrity of the information as, as it is being processed. Most organizations have a variety of security processes which must be implemented. You should choose models that provide the most relevance for the important InfoSec considerations in your organization. A trusted computing base is the combination of all hardware, firmware, and software responsible for enforcing the security policy in place at your organization. In this context, security policy refers to the rules of configuration for a system rather than a managerial guidance document. The trusted computing base is made up of the hardware and software that has been implemented to provide security for a particular information system. Within the trusted computing base is a conceptual object known as a reference monitor, which is the piece of the system that manages access control. In other words, it mediates all access to objects by people, subjects, entities. Systems administrators must be able to audit or periodically review the reference monitor to ensure it is functioning effectively without unauthorized modification. Covert channels are unauthorized or unintended models, methods of communications hidden inside a computer system. Two examples are storage and timing channels. Storage channels transfer information through the setting of bits by one program and the reading of those bits by another. What distinguishes this case from that of ordinary operation is that the bits are used to convey encoded protected information. Steganography concealing information in such a manner that no one but the intended recipient even knows that the existence of the message is a good example of a covert storage channel. Timing channels, in contrast, transfer, transmit information by managing the relative timing of events. A covert timing channel example would include a file intended to hold only audit information to convey user passwords using the name of a file or perhaps status bits associated with it that can be read by all users to signal the contents of the file. Information security professionals must protect from both of these types of covert channels. The Information Technology System Evaluation Criteria is an international set of criteria for evaluating computer systems. It's very similar to the concept of trusted computing we discussed previously. Under IT system evaluation, there are targets of evaluation. These targets of evaluation are compared to detailed security function specifications, resulting in an assessment of systems functionality and comprehensive penetration testing. Like trusted computing, IT system evaluation criteria was, for the most part, functionally replaced by the common criteria that we will discuss now. The common criteria for information technology security evaluation, often called common criteria or CC, is an international standard ISO IEC 15408 
for computer security certification. It is widely considered the successor to both trusted computing and IT system evaluation we just discussed. Although the concepts are similar, CC reconciles some of the differences between the various other standards. CC is a combined effort of contributors from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, France, Germany, Japan, the Netherlands, Spain, the United Kingdom, and the U.S. The common criteria process assures that the specification, implementation, and evaluation of computer security products are performed in a rigorous and standardized manner. To summarize, organizations should consider using standard InfoSec models to ensure consistent implementation of policies in an overall information security plan. The policies must be implemented across all technology, including, including hardware, software, and firmware. InfoSec pro professionals are obligated to ensure the confidentiality and integrity of all data. Models provide guidelines on how to implement InfoSec policies and plans. The Common Criteria Model provides a useful guide for standardizing the implementation of security policies and plans. It was a joint international effort and is the international standard for computer security certification. We continue with Chapter 8, Security Management Models. This is Section 5, Confidentiality and Integrity Models. In this section, we will cover the third and fourth learning outcomes, recommend an InfoSec management model, and explain how it can be customized to meet the needs of a particular organization, and describe the fundamental elements of key InfoSec management practices. The Bell La Padula confidentiality model helps ensure confidentiality of an information system by means of mandatory access controls that we just discussed, data classification, and security clearances. With this model, a state machine model may be used. This is one in which the design follows a conceptual approach where the state of the content of the system being modeled is always in a known secure condition. In other words, this kind of model is provably secure. A system that serves as a re reference monitor compares a level of classification of the data with the clearance of the entity requesting access. It allows access only if the clearance level is equal to or higher than the classification. Bell La Padula confidentiality model security rules prevent information from being moved from a higher level of security to a level of lower security. In this model, access modes can be one of two types, simple security and the star property. Simple security, also called the read property, prohibits a subject of lower clearance from reading an object of higher classification, but allows a subject with a higher clearance level to read an object at a lower level, so they have read down access based on their clearance or classification. The star property, in contrast, is called the write property. It prohibits a high-level subject from sending messages to a lower-level object. In short, subjects can read down and objects can write or, or append up. The BIBA model assigns integrity levels to subjects and objects using two properties, the simple integrity property or the integrity property. The simple integrity or read property permits a subject to have read access to an object only if the security level of the subject is either lower 
or equal to the level of the object. The integrity property or right property permits the subject to have right access to an object only if the security level of the subject is equal to or higher than that of the object. The Clark-Wilson integrity model, which is built upon principles of change control rather than integrity levels, was designed for the commercial environment. The change control principles upon which it operates are no changes by unauthorized subjects. If you don't have the rights to access, you can't make changes. No unauthorized changes by authorized subjects. Even if you have the access, you still cannot make unauthorized changes. And the maintenance of internal and external consistency. Controls are checked and rechecked and maintained to ensure consistency internally and externally. The following controls are part of the CWI model. Subject authentication and identification. The person is properly authenticated, identified and authenticated through control measures and, and then allowed to access specific systems. Access to objects by means of well-formed transactions. You have properly developed rules in place to ensure that transactions have integrity and they follow rules. And execution by subjects on a restricted set of programs. You can only view and make changes to programs that you are authorized to use through specific controls. The elements of the Clark-Wilson model include the following. The first element refers first to a constrained data item or CDI. CDIs have protected integrity within CWI. Second is the unconstrained data item. With this element, data is not controlled by Clark-Wilson. The input and or outputs may not be val validated. Obviously, with highly sensitive healthcare data, you want very little of, of your elements to be unconstrained. Third is the Integrity Verification Procedure, or IVP. With this procedure, data is scanned and integrity is confirmed. And finally is a Transformation Procedure, or TP. This procedure only allows changes to a constrained data item, one that has access control protections and data integrity rules for entering and updating information. The Graham-Denning Access Control Model has three parts. First, a set of objects. Next, a set of subjects. And third, a set of rights, which then leads to access control rules. With this model, the subjects are composed of two things, a process and a domain. The domain is a set of constraints controlling how subjects may access objects. The eight primitive protection rights for Graham Dennis access control include creating and deleting objects and subjects and access to read, grant, delete, and transfer. The Harrison Ruzzo Ullman or HRU model defines a method to allow changes to access rights and the addition and removal of subjects and objects a process that the bell la Padula model does not. Since systems change over time, their protective states also need to change. HRU is built on an access control matrix and includes a set of generic rights and a specific set of commands. The Brewer-Nash model, commonly known as a Chinese wall, 
is designed to prevent a conflict of interest between two parties. Look up Chinese Wall if you haven't heard of what that is, and it will, you'll see how it got the name. The Brewer-Nash model requires users to select one of two conflicting sets of data, after which they cannot access the conflicting data. They have to choose which one to use. In summary, there are many different models that may be used to implement security plans and policies. The models have different focus areas and may be more appropriate in some organization than others. As stated previously and throughout the course, you should use one model or components or adaptations from several models to implement the information security plans in your organization. We continue with Chapter 8, Security Management Models. This is Section 6, ISO and NIST. In this section, we will cover the final learning outcome, discuss emerging trends in the certification and accreditation of U.S. federal IT systems. One of the most widely referenced and often discussed security models is Information Technology Code of Practice for Information Security Management, which was originally published as British Standard BS haha, 7799 and then later as ISO IEC 17799. It has since been renamed ISO IEC 27002. The original purpose was to offer guidance for the management of InfoSec to individuals responsible for their organization's security programs. According to 27000.org, the standard was, quote, intended to provide a common basis for developing organizational security standards and effective security management practice and to provide confidence in interorganizational dealings. As a healthcare organization, you will be dealing with multiple organizational units, so this will be helpful to think about as you're designing information security plans. The major process steps with ISO IEC 27001 uses the Plan Do Change Act set of steps. So you plan, you do, you plan it, you do it, you change it, you act upon it. Each step has clearly defined outcomes and deliverables. The process may continue again after taking action with planning based on changing needs, then doing, then changing, then acting, and so forth. ISO IEC 27002 sections provide a detailed roadmap of implementing InfoSec security into the organization. First is determining the structure of the information security unit. What organizational hierarchy is appropriate to use, for instance? Second is risk assessment and treatment. Where are the biggest risks? Personally identifiable healthcare data may be the biggest risk in the, in the hospital or healthcare. Next is security policy, which clearly outlines the plans and procedures and processes that will be used with InfoSec in the organization followed by asset management. Do you have expensive equipment to maintain? Do you have high cost entities, for instance, doctors, whose time to use the system, to learn to use the system should be minimized? Next is human resource security. Do you have a stable staff that meets the current and future needs of the organization? For instance, if your information security group is constantly hiring or laying off people, then you may need to rethink InfoSec. Perhaps you outsource if it's not a core competency of your organization, and it may not be in a healthcare organization. Physical and environmental security cannot be overlooked either. While it's desirable to have physical and digital security together as one unit, that may not be possible at all organizations. 
If not explicitly housed together, the two groups need to at least work closely to protect all of the information assets of the organization. Next, consider communications and operations. How do people communicate? via text, instant message apps, email, etc. Identify the most common communication methods, secure them, train staff on how to use them, and integrate the use of the devices into the InfoSec planning. What sorts of access control procedures are in place? You want to make sure that the people who need to access and make changes have the ability to do so, while others may have only readability and still others may have no access to certain records. Next, how are information systems acquired, developed, and maintained? Does the organization provide the necessary resources for the team to secure the important information assets of the organization? Next, how are information security incidents handled? That is, when something goes wrong, invalid login, log compromised data, etc. How is it reported, reported, remediated, and overcome? When a breach occurs, and it will, what is your plan for business continuity management? How will the system stay up and running if the area around the hospital floods, a natural disaster? If you're dealing with people who may be critically ill, you need to have backup generators and other policies in place to ensure un uninterrupted power. If a power outage lasts too long, Think of the hospital in New Orleans during, during Katrina, for instance. You may have to make evacuation plans for critically ill patients. Finally, how will you make sure that users comply with the information security policies and plans in place? What controls will you use? What educational programs will you implement? And how will you get the word out to your constituents about information security? Using these defined sections and some of the models we already covered, an organization should be able to get an information security plan developed and implemented from start to finish. NIST documents, I encourage you to use them. They have a couple of notable advantages. They are publicly available online at no charge, and they've been available for some time and thus have been broadly reviewed by government and industry professionals. They have a wide variety of reference materials available, including Computer Security Handbook, Generally Accepted Security Principles and Practices, Guide for Developing Security Plans, and Security Self-Assessment Guide IT Systems, along with Risk Management for Information Technology Systems. The NIST special publication 800-12 Revision 1, which was fairly recently, July 2017, is an introduction to information security. It is an excellent reference and guide for the routine management of information security. While little guidance is provided on design and implement, implementation of new security systems, this NIST doc publication may be used as a supplement to gain a deeper understanding of background and technology. It lays out the NIST philosophy on security management by identifying 17 controls organized into three categories. First, the management control section addresses security topics of concern for managerial levels. Second, the operational control section addresses security controls that focus on controls that are, broadly speaking, implemented and executed by people as opposed to systems. Both are considered entities, but you have to handle that transfer of data from a person differently as from a system. Finally, the technical control system section focuses on security controls that the computer system itself executes. SP 800-14 generally accepted principles and practices for securing information technology systems is also a useful reference guide 
providing a foundational guideline for conducting multi-organizational as well as internal business. It provides a baseline of information security that organizations can use to initially establish or review their IT security programs and allows the reader to gain an understanding of the basic security requirements that should be a part of most good IT systems. Managers, internal auditors, users, system developers, and security practitioners could benefit from reviewing this free publication. If it's free, why not? NIST 800-14 includes several key points that should be part of any effective InfoSec policy. Security supports the mission of the organization. It's never the other way around. You may not need the newest technology unless it supports the organizational mission. You should acquire technology and expertise in line with the needs of your organization and the mission that they seek to achieve. Security is an integral element of sound management. Physical and digital security of information assets is an important element for any organization that collects any information that is personally identifiable, sensitive, legally protected, etc. You have to secure the information assets of the organization. Security should be cost effective and should be based on the inherent importance of secure information assets at your organization. Healthcare organizations, for instance, are going to spend significant amounts of resources to secure the personally identifiable health data that patients provide to them. Fines for noncompliance can be high and it doesn't matter if you didn't intend to release the data, you still are likely to be fined. Systems owners have security responsibilities outside their own organizations. For instance, insurance coordinators at a hospital may have to exchange data with outside insurance agencies. The owner of that data must ensure that the personally identifiable information being released from your organization to the other is going to the correct entity and that the receiving entity has appropriate security mechanisms in place to protect that personally identifiable information. Security responsibilities and accountability should be made very explicit. Who needs to do what and under what circumstances? Reinforce user responsibilities through properly designed and well-maintained security education training and awareness programs. Security requires a comprehensive and integrated approach leaving in even one portion of the system or one set of records unprotected may compromise the security of the entire organization. Security is only as strong as its weakest link. Security should be periodically re reassessed at different times and when the situation changes. And finally, security is constrained by societal factors, including budget, organizational culture, regulatory environment, and so forth. Numerous NIST publications are available free of charge, as mentioned, and you should take advantage of those that are relevant for your organization. Some publications include Guide for Developing Security Plans for Federal Information Systems, this publication provides detailed methods for assessing, designing, and implementing controls and plans for applications of various sizes. It also includes templates for major application security plans. The Guide for Conducting Risk, risk Assessments. This publication provides a foundation for the development of an effective risk management program containing both the definitions and the practical guidance necessary for assessing and mitigating risk identified within IT systems. The ultimate goal here is to help organizations better manage IT-related mission risks. It is organized into three chapters that explain the overall risk management process as well as preparing for, conducting, and communicating a risk assessment. The Guide for Assessing 
the security controls, and federal information systems and organizations. This publication provides a systems development lifecycle approach to security assessment of information systems. NIST documents describe a comprehensive security control assessment program and guide organizations through the preparation for, assessment of, and remediation of critical security controls. As you can see from this chart, NIST provides very detailed process guidelines and clear definitions to help as you are developing information security plans and implementing them at the, your organization. One drawback is that there are so many documents, it's not always easy to navigate and find the information you need when you're browsing on the NIST website, particularly for a somewhat inexperienced InfoSec professional. Let's look at COVID, which is Control Objectives for Information and Related Technology. It is another resource that provides advice about the implementation of sound controls and objectives for InfoSec. It was created by the Information Systems Audit and Control Association and the IT Governance Institute in 1992. COBIT provides five principles focused on the governance and management of IT in an organization. Principle one is meeting stakeholder needs. InfoSec plans and policies should be designed with the needs of the stakeholders in mind, along with the organizational mission statement. Principle two, covering the enterprise end to end. This includes ensuring the integrity of the data you receive from others and securing the data that you send to others. Principle three is applying a single integrated framework rather than a patchwork of policies integrated in response to problems. Principle four, enabling a holistic approach, able to see the whole and make an informed decision on InfoSec policies that will work for all. Principle five, separate, separating governance from management. Governing policies, plans, and procedures are different from day-to-day -day management of information security policies. The COBIT-5 framework also incorporates a series of enablers to support the principles. Principles, policies, and frameworks are the vehicle to translate the desired behavior into practical guidance for day-to-day -day management. Processes describe an organized set of practices and activities to achieve certain objectives and produce a set of outputs in support of achieving overall IT-related goals. Organizational structures are the key decision-making entities in an er enterprise. Culture, ethics, and behavior of individuals and of the enterprise are very often underestimated as a success factor in governance and management activities. Information is required for keeping the organization running and well-governed but at the operational level, information is very often the key product of the enterprise itself. Finally, services, infrastructure, and applications to include the IT infrastructure, technology, and applications that provide the enterprise with information technology processing and services. Then we have the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations, or COSO. This is a U.S. private sector initiative formed in 1985. Its major objective is to identify the factors that cause fraudulent financial reporting and to make recommendations to reduce its incidence. It has established a common definition of internal controls, standards, and criteria, and it helps organizations comply with critical reg regulations like Sarbanes-Oxley. Internal control is a process affected by an entity's board of directors, management, and other personnel designed to provide reasonable assurance regarding the achievement of, of objectives in the following categories. Effectiveness and efficiency of operations. How well are we doing? How quickly are we doing it? 
reliability of financial reporting. Are we reporting what's really true? And compliance with applicable laws and regulations. How are we securing our data and have we had any penalties? The Committee of Sponsoring Organizations is built on five interrelated components. Having a controlled environment that manages all components of the information security plan is important, as is risk assessment and mitigation and having a plan for that. Control activities that ensure in integrity and confidentiality of data. You have your information and communication distributed to the right people with the right access, with the right security at the right time. And finally, monitoring throughout the organization to improve information security implementation. Information Technology Infrastructure Library is a collection of methods and practices useful for managing the development and operation of information technology infrastructures. It has been produced as a series of books, each of which covers an IT management topic. Since it includes a detailed description of many significant IT-related practices, it can be tailored to many different IT organizations. The Information Security Governance Framework is a managerial model which provides guidance in the development and implementation of an organizational information security governance structure. The core of the information security governance framework includes recommendations for the responsibilities of members of an organization. Information governance responsibilities are well established within this framework. You have a board of directors and trustees that should provide strategic oversight regarding information security. Senior executives should provide oversight of a comprehensive information security program for the entire organization. Executive team members who report to a senior executive should oversee the organization's security policies and practices. Senior managers provide information security for the information and information systems that support the operations and assets under their control. And ultimately, all employees and users have the responsibility to main secure, maintain security of information and information systems accessible to them. In the end, it's not the responsibility of one person or one organization or one unit of an organization. It's the responsibility of the system as, whole, as a whole to ensure that information assets protected. To summarize, one of the most widely referenced security models is ISO IEC 27001 2005 Information Technology Code of Practice for InfoSec Management, which is designed to give recommendations for InfoSec managers. Other approaches to structuring InfoSec management are found in the many documents av available from NIST's Computer Security Resource Center. COBIT provides advice about the implementation of sound controls and control objectives for InfoSec. The Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission has established a common definition of internal control standards and criteria against which companies and organizations can assess their control systems. And the Information Technology Infrastructure Library is a collection of methods and practices useful for managing the development and operation of information technology infrastructures. The Information Security government Governance Framework is a managerial model provided by an industry working group that provides guidance in the development and implementation of an organizational InfoSec governance structure. Use elements of these models that work with your situation and the information security needs of your organization.